Hello, and welcome to the first episode of the Daddy of Them All podcast, where we'll explore all things Cheyenne Frontier Days. I'm Diane Schober, Executive Director at the Wyoming Office of Tourism. I've been the Executive Director at the Wyoming Office of Tourism for 20 years, and I have the great pleasure of promoting Wyoming and the best things about Wyoming to people all around the world, which means really the heart of the American cowboy. And what's more appropriate than that than Cheyenne Frontier Days? Uh, I'm thrilled to be here to explore what makes Cheyenne Frontier Days the daddy of them all. So whether you're a seasoned attendee or experiencing your first rodeo, we ask that you join us this season as we uncover the stories, traditions, and excitement that make Cheyenne Frontier Days truly special. So get ready for a journey unlike any other. As someone who's deeply passionate about Western culture and heritage, I've been captivated by the spirit of Cheyenne Frontier Days for years, and I'm extremely honored to have been invited to be the first host of the first podcast for Cheyenne Frontier Days. I am here with my friend and my colleague, Tom Hersick, who's the CEO of Cheyenne Frontier Days and who has deep roots in the very upbringing of this celebration. Hi, Tom. Hey, Diane. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing I'm today? well. It's I, nice to I, see you. I think you left out. How many times have you been like tourism director of the year? You're probably the most phenomenal state tourism director there is. Well, in the eyes probably only of my mom and maybe you <laughs> every year. But You've other than that, year. I know. We've known each other a long time. Yes, we have. We've been friends since way back in our college days. Right. As you like to refer to it, I think we met in the library, in the library. In co-library. Right. We were in oh. a study group. In a, Yes, yes. Very studious. Study Friday, group. Friday and Saturday nights only. We studied the Lone Bandit Saloon yes. and the Cowboy Bar, right? Yes, we did. Yeah. Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah, it's... um. Yeah, we ha- we've had a lot of fun over the years and certainly um, have shared a lot of, you know, we have mutual friends. We've run in the same circles and uh, it's it's been exciting to watch you grow in your career and to where you are today. Um, and I certainly cherish the friendship that we've had all along the way. So thanks, Tom, for that. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. I'm just honored to be here. I told you it was a privilege when you invited me and um, I'm excited because I I love this event. Uh, it has a deep connection for me from, you know, coming here as a child and and then family who've been involved and watching family uh, who've competed here and now in this role uh, where we get to entertain clients and and bring friends. And so it's great. And I am just thrilled um, that you are here to share some of this history. Well, the one thing you you didn't bring up was your six years on our board of directors of Shay and Frontier Days. Is that... Um, you know, I was I was going to bring it up a little bit later as we talked about some yeah. of the board things. But when I think about my career and the opportunity that I've had to serve on boards, this clearly was one of the pinnacles right. of that kind of board service. I learned so much. I met so many people and it just really deepened my love for what this Western celebration means, not only to Cheyenne, uh, but to Wyoming and really the uh, the United States. And it's just um, special, special times. Thank you. It's a big impact. Thank it you. is. Thank you. So let's get started. Okay. All right. Um, take us back to 1897 in the very first, first Frontier Days. Okay. So your family has a really deep connection to this right. and is a big part of the tapestry of Cheyenne Frontier Days. So my great-great-uncle Charlie Hersig was one of the co-founders of Cheyenne Frontier Days. So my family basically has been involved in Cheyenne Frontier Days since the very first event. And and of course, I grew up in it. I don't. I've never missed a Shane Frontier Days my whole life. Um, so it's always been a part of our life. I mean, it's a part of our family heritage, and and it's something that our family really takes deep pride in. And as we talk, you know, through this, we had lots of involvement from all different family members in Shane Frontier Days. So it has been a long, long legacy. What what, what have been some of the <clears throat> excuse me some of the standout like family members or milestone things that have happened over, uh, you know, the, the decades, a century that we've over a century that we've been experiencing Cheyenne frontier days. Well, I think you gotta, I mean, Charlie Hersig was one of the co-founders and, and the things that he did from being a stock contractor to a general chairman to, uh, you know, just all the things he did for Cheyenne frontier days. He certainly was the original one uh, that in our family, but you know, my dad, he, uh, my dad, Buddy, 
he spent 37 years as the arena director out here, which, you know, that, that's a long time to stand in the arena when it's raining and 110 degrees. And yeah. so there's a lot of things with that. My aunt Margie was uh, Miss Frontier in 1954, I believe. Um, my sister Sandy was named Lady in Waiting in uh, 1979. Um, and tragically she was in a car wreck with my mom and, and she lost her life in that car wreck. So she never got to fulfill her term as Miss Frontier. Uh, but, but certainly very proud of her accomplishments. Both of my sisters, Sandy and Debbie served in the dandies program for years. Um, my mom, uh, she's been a wheels, uh, which is the, the female group of the parades that do all the period costumes and, and get people dressed up for the parades. They, they wash the wagons. They do all kinds of stuff with parades. So so we've been involved in it, you yeah. know, uh, every part of it pretty much. Yeah. I, when I think about, like, even with uh, your Uncle Charlie and, and then the, uh, the beginning of Frontier Days, I think about the genesis of it mm -hmm. and what it would take for community leaders and how it was really around economic development and an attraction. And I think about today as we use it, right. you know, this as a uh, tourism attractor and a motivator for visitation. Yeah. I mean, you know, your family must have been deeply committed to not only just an event, but to Cheyenne and, and to this part of Wyoming. Well, absolutely. And, and, and even then they were concerned about preserving the Western heritage, even mm -hmm. as far back as 1897. Mm -hmm. So how Cheyenne Frontier Days got its start was, uh, a gentleman from Union Pacific came to Cheyenne um, the, uh, the year before, and Cheyenne was really struggling. The the ag was in the it was really struggling. The economy in Cheyenne was horrible. The Union Pacific had a vested interest because their trains went through here, and so they were concerned about is Cheyenne even going to make it. And so he came up here and met with a lot of the business leaders and said, "What well, you know? What can we do to bring people to town?" and you know, they were kind of dumbfounded because there's not a lot of attractions mm -hmm. to get people to move to Cheyenne. And so when he was getting on the train to go back to Denver, he watched some cowboys trying to load a horse in a in a boxcar. And, the, of course, that horse wanted no part of getting in that boxcar. And they were fighting with the horse and wrestling with him and finally <laughs> got him in there. And it dawned on him. He said, this is what people in Denver would like to see. They'd like to see this interaction with animals and, and humans. And so... That's really where the start of Cheyenne Frontier Days came. He he came back and they had, you know, Cheyenne Frontier yeah. Day in 1897. And a day. A one day they were supposed to have saddle bronc riding and steer roping. But so many people came, they got through the saddle bronc riding and it got dark. So they didn't even get to have the steer roping that year. All they had was the saddle bronc riding. Mm -hmm. And so then they started expanding it into, you know, kind of the days it is now. Yeah. But, but, you know, it, the way it got started was kind of a fluke. If he wouldn't have seen those cowboys doing that, the idea never would have been born for Shane Frontier Days. I think that's the allure of the real West and kind of the wild West. Right. And then, you know, bringing it to those who maybe aren't always who live in urban environments, even in today's world where we're so far removed in many cases from our agrarian roots yeah. and what started. And I think, you know, what a, what a brilliant mind to think here's an opportunity uh, to share this and then to have something that has sustained um, its legacy for so many right. years um, over time. It's I, hard to conceive that even back in 1897 that there was a disconnect between like the cowboy way of life and, and the urban way of life. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, your family has, as you mentioned through uh, just sharing with some of your family that uh, has been involved in some of the accomplishments, your dad being an arena mm -hmm. director, your sister, um, are there some um, of your most cherished memories or traditions that come to mind when you think about this long family history? And then you just as as an individual and a family member at, at this point of the Hersic connection to Cheyenne Frontier Days. You know, absolutely. There's there's so many memories that are created at Cheyenne Frontier Days. I guess, you know, we've talked about this before, but your concert, my first concert was at Cheyenne Frontier Days. And I think I was probably six or seven years old when I went to the first concert. And it, I remember it was the cast of Gunsmoke. And for all you young people that don't know what Gunsmoke is, it was a, a Western that everybody watched. It was had Miss Kitty and Festus was brought his mule and was playing his guitar riding up and down the track. And, and uh, you know, they were all here. And, and I vividly, re that's one of my earliest recollections in my whole life of anything mm -hmm. that happened. So, and 
I mean, you... well, yes, mine was Loretta Lynn. I was a little bit older. I was 12. Right. And, but not that much older than you are. But I was <laughs> uh, later. Yeah. I was 12 years old. Uh, came down with my parents. And I just remember, I remember being in awe. I, I felt like the crowd was so enormous. And it was yeah. even then. Uh, but live music and really then just engaging with, you know, that. And I mean, we went to the rodeo. We experienced all of it. I shared with you that I recently found a chalk drawing that we'd done from some vendor under the grandstands uh, when we were cleaning up my mother's home. She had saved it. It must have been really special to her. Yeah. And I still have it in my storage room, too. Wow. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And I mean, other other big memories of um, the, the year, the tragic uh, loss of the Thunderbird pilot uh, yeah. when their plane wrecked, which is really, I mean, an incredible story. They um, So my father and I, we were, we were in Slack every morning. So we were actually in the arena when that plane came towards the arena and, and, it, and eventually ended up stopping about a hundred feet right in front of where we were on the other side of the grandstands. But the, that pilot, he actually guided that plane through, I mean, all of our Cowboys park out behind where this plane came through and actually a trailer had pulled out the night before and somehow he got that plane to go through that spot. He didn't touch a camper, didn't touch anything through all of our parking lots. And, you know, finally ended up, you know, uh, dad and I were in the arena and I, you could hear this loud whistling noise. It was just, I mean, something that you'd never heard before. And, and then this big loud thud and there was a, the, the, the pilot that was in, or the, the pilot was in the back of the plane that when they injected, it put him over the top. He landed on actually on top of the grandstands, his parachute deployed. The other one ejected too late because he was trying to guide that plane through all that. He could have bailed on that plane a long, long time before that caused lots of damage, but he didn't. And he didn't survive. But the, but my dad and I are sitting in the arena and all of a sudden this guy comes rolling off the top of the grandstands with a parachute on. And it's like, what in the world is going on? And then there was just, smoke so so thick you couldn't see like your horse's ears it was just how old were you tom i was probably uh somewhere around a like a freshman in high school yeah uh, so like yeah yeah 28 yeah 28 <laughs> um i remember um you know my uh my brother was down here helping uh, at the time i think nick harris had some of the roping steers mm -hmm on contract and he was down here during that time and my, my cousin rusty yeah. our dear friend yeah uh, but yeah just at one of those things and again a, a tribute to the military wow. uh who who work today uh to help protect civilians but even in those kinds of crises they're trained for that yeah. and you know to do as as much uh, as little as damage as possible you know what's interesting about all that is like we finished out our slack that morning had our performance that afternoon and it was right in the heart of our show yeah um, you probably couldn't do that today. They probably would have shut down the site for the rest of the week, but, but that wasn't the way it was back then. Yeah. The show, but as always, the show goes on. I mean, right? that's been throughout all of this history of Cheyenne frontier days. The show has gone on. Absolutely. Even in those years of, I think about like during world war two, when, you know, you, you utilize so many women yeah. as contestants because so many American men were fighting uh, in the war, and yet the, sh the show went on. Yeah. And so just uh, a lot of great things in the history there. Um, as we uh, continue to think about some of the great things that have happened, you know, the, one of the things that has always been intriguing to me, and I think for people outside of the rodeo world that know Cheyenne Frontier Days intimately, is the um, uh, part of the operation of this organization and its volunteer base. Right. And... You have been a volunteer and have, I mean, in your uh, role now as CEO, it's a little bit different, but you're overseeing volunteers with volunteers. Mm -hmm. Can you share with our listeners just insight on how this works, what it has meant to be a volunteer, what it means to you as a CEO to have volunteers here? I just think that it's something that's you unique about Cheyenne Frontier Days, and I would love to get a little bit deeper into that. So, you know, we talk a lot about volunteerism at Cheyenne Frontier Days, and, and currently we've got about 3,000 volunteers, which, you know, in a community of 75,000 people, that's not, that's a lot of people that volunteer at Cheyenne Frontier Days. And we have people that start out volunteering here, and they they move somewhere else, take a job, and then they well, they take their two weeks vacation and come back here and volunteer. We, we, we call it 
if we ever get you to take a drink of the Kool-Aid to be a volunteer out here, you're hooked forever. And it's, and I think it's the pride factor. So, so one of the things that we, we have volunteers do is volunteers have the opportunity to rise through and be leadership of Cheyenne Frontier Days, help make decisions, help make operational decisions. And, and, and so they have a vested interest. A lot of places you go when you volunteer, it's pretty much laid out to you. This is what you do. But they help develop those policies on how we run the show. So when customers come to Cheyenne Frontier Days, they're not treated by paid staff that's helping them find their seats. It's basically volunteers, people that want to be there. So it's a, a different experience than you get anywhere else. But but the pride factor in that in that event and I mean we talk about things like there's there's no more Cheyenne has more songs written about it than any other city in the world. <laughs> and that's directly reflected upon Cheyenne Frontier Days and the tradition that we've yeah. built here. Yeah. So you know that there's so you and it's amazing. Like when you have Garth Brooks come and sing, and he has songs about Wyoming and Cheyenne, he probably doesn't have songs about other states because it just doesn't resonate. Yeah, we resonate in that Western heritage, and that so we have a lot of like-minded people that love the Western heritage that volunteer out here, and and we have volunteers that, I mean, we have forty. I mean, I volunteered for 40 plus years before I became yeah. a CEO and I had no intentions of, of being the CEO. It was just part of my life. Yeah. So you, um, you talked about, you know, rising up in the ranks where, where this is what makes part of this organization unique. I mean, this is, this is a 10 day Western celebration that includes a rodeo and concerts and a carnival, but so many other things that embrace activities with parades and, and, you know, things downtown and, around the state. And so certainly there's a need for, you know, this mass production of people to carry out the operations, but really that sits at the heart of it on, you know, this cowboy culture is the rodeo. And you were uh, what was called the contestants chairman back mm -hmm. then. Uh, now I think it's the rodeo yeah. uh, uh, chairman, but just tell, uh, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, how long did you serve and what did you do to even lead up to that? Like what were some of your positions as a volunteer on that committee that led to you serving as the contestants chairman? So, of course, um, I started out volunteering out here with, when my dad was the arena director. When I, I think I was about 10 years old when I started bringing my horse to, to town. We, I grew up on a ranch about 50 miles north of Cheyenne, uh, a 20,000 acre cattle ranch. And the end of July is not really the greatest time for you to take a vacation and, and just for 10 days ranch for 10 days. So, so, but we did there. I mean, that was just part of our life. We, we made sure that everything, everybody had everything they needed and we went to town for 10 days. Um, so I started running cattle out of the arena when I was about 10 years old and, and, and I kept doing that and finally, you know, started working in the arena a little bit more on my horse. Um, uh, as I got older, and then when my dad decided to step down as arena director, I took over as arena director from him. So my volunteer role evolved into that. And really, you know, I, I live in 50 miles out of town. I didn't really get to partake in all the volunteer activities. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't here for, we have Saturday work days where we clean up the park. And so I was kind of non-traditional in that role, but, but I think uh, the general chairman at that time, Dale Von Krosick really felt like they needed somebody with a rodeo background to, step in as contestants uh, chairman, which, which I did. I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but because I was still, you know. What my, do you think cowboys are a little temperamental at times? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. All right. Just checking in. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, kind of my background goes back to also when, you know, my rodeo career, you know, basically started in high school and I went to a few high school rodeos and then I walked on at the University of Wyoming my freshman year and 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 ended up getting scholarships uh, after my first semester. I have a scholarship for the rest of the time there. That started my rodeo career. Um, and I came, you know, I, I uh, after college, uh, I joined the professional ranks and professional rodeoed for uh, quite a few years and, and ended up, you know, uh, being somewhat successful. But but that that kind of propelled me into my lo my role as contestants chairman because um of my rodeo background. I understood what was going on yeah. in rodeo. So you had context and perspective Yeah, that you could, I, I'm sure it helped excel you to be an excellent ch chairman. You know, I always think when you think of arena director and, and that you mentioned your dad was, was it 35 years, 37, years. 37 mm -hmm. years. 
and you were the arena director. And I know, you know, just hearing this throughout the Cheyenne Frontier Days conversations, uh, what, what is that and what makes it different? What is the difference for the contestants chairman? Um, well, so the arena director is the, you're, you're in the arena with, on your horse mm -hmm. and, and you're really, and it's funny because it's similar to being the role as the CEO. You're the guy that puts out fires. When something goes wrong, you've got to be on the spot to fix it. And so when you're not doing anything, things are good, but, but you, our rodeo is so fast paced. Uh, the arena director position is so critical to us because when something does go wrong and when it will, because when you're dealing with animals, cowboys, something's going to go haywire, you've got to be able to fix that. Whether it's just a bull jump in the fence or, you know, whatever it may mm -hmm. be, you've got to, you've got to know how to solve those situations immediately to keep the rodeo going. So, um, that's uh that was my dad's role that's my role now it's frank thompson's role who is our arena director that's a former world champion steer wrestler yeah. and and certainly he has that background in rodeo too i um you know it knowing you like i know you you've always been a problem solver and someone who's quick to come with solutions and i think that uh, that's a strong character of leaders and i just want to compliment you my friend on that uh it's carried well, you I well i didn't have a choice i mean i, I grew up in that arena where you had to well, make decisions this is, this is part of the, the, the cowboy way too i right. think it is you know you you grow up on a ranch and you make decisions and you are you don't have a lot of other resources at your fingertips right. and sometimes it can be yeah. uh in a, a situation that could be very critical and dangerous or it may be just what are we going to do for the best opportunity and especially in an arena where you have uh, tens of thousands of people watching you in right. these stands, you know, you take into consideration also, what is the public, you know, what, what decision am I going to make that uh, will have the greatest impact or the right. least impact upon them? Right. So uh, what are some of your most memorable moments about being uh, the arena director? Well, I, I guess, you know, the, again, the, one of the saddest times was Lane Frost. You yeah, know, that was a I wasn't very far from him when that happened. And I knew Lane pretty well because we rodeoed in the same era. So yeah. uh, that was a tough one. That was, that was really a tough time, but you know, just, just the thrill of winning Cheyenne Frontier Days for those contestants and, and knowing a lot of them and, you know, winning Cheyenne Frontier Days is there's no other experience like that. I mean, it's a bucket list for everybody that ever ropes, rides in pro rodeo. That's why it's called the daddy. That's right. So I think those experiences of seeing some of those guys win Shane Frontier Days, um, you know, I, I remember John W. Jones making an amazing run in the Bulldog and to, he got trapped against the fence and, and somehow got by and through the steer in the finals to win it. And, and so, you know, some of those memories of those guys, you know, conquering that because our arena is big. It's hard to win at Cheyenne. It's, it's one of the hardest places in the world to win. So when you finally conquer that, it's it's great to see those those emotions. I think in every conversation of cowboy circles, the most coveted buckle is the Cheyenne. Buckle. Absolutely. Yeah, and and again, I think that's why when you even referenced in pop culture and music and in movies and everything, it's always I need to make it to Cheyenne, and you know it just uh, it resonates. Well, you well, you look at. If you ever watch Garth Brooks or George Strait, yeah. who, who, what buckle we give the artist buckles uh, yeah. when they come to Shane Frontier Days. You look at what buckle they wear all the time. I mean, that's they play everywhere. Yes, yes. I, I mean, it is a, a prized possession. It is. I mean, even I have a couple of uh, pieces uh, like a bolo, and even my uh, board of directors badge. Right. Is you know it's always something that I wear with great pride, and I and, and a lot of it engages a lot of conversation from others around it. Um, you know, just, yeah, a lot of pride there. So our buckle has been, has been the same for a long time. And it's kind of a, I mean, a plain looking buckle. It's a little kind of square yeah. buckle, but in the rodeo world, people can recognize that clear across the room. They know the Shane buckle. I remember having a conversation one time at, um, in the stands and, the, and there was a girl that was there and she was looking at the buckle and she said, well, this is, this isn't that like just not eye catching or anything. And this other this cowboy was sitting there and he said something to the effect that it doesn't matter. Every cowboy in the world knows that buckle and, and they can spot it from a long ways away. 
this is a whole other podcast, Tommy. We need to go into <laughs> the, I mean, honestly, the craftsmanship and the artisanship yep. of saddles and boots and then the uniqueness of a, of a Cheyenne buckle. Mm -hmm. um, I just think in the Western heritage and all those things that we celebrate, you know, they're things um, that are definitely worthy of recognizing. Right. You know, I mentioned that um, about, uh, lightly about my service on the board. And I know that this is a volunteer board of directors that's here. Um, I came onto the board, I believe, in 2010. And I know that uh, there have traditionally been mostly people who have served as chairman, committee chairman coming up. Mm -hmm. And uh, there had been a recent addition to let's start to go out and, and find community members right. to come in. And um, I was serving on the board. I think I'd been on the board maybe two years when you joined. What year did you join? Was it 12? 12. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking. Um, how did you feel about it when you were joining? I know how I felt about it when you were joining the board, but I know, I'm know i curious what you felt and, and just share that with us. Well, I think it was, I mean, to me, it was kind of a, uh, I took quite a, quite a break. Uh, I, I kind of uh, stepped away from Frontier Days after I was the contestants chairman um, because, you know, you, you need to let other leadership roles evolve. Yes. I mean, that that's succession planning for our event. You know, that's what we struggle with. People get so happy with what they're doing and they're, they have such a big impact. We don't necessarily always train somebody. Yeah. So, so I think it was, it was, it, for me, it was being able to step up to that 30,000 foot view of Cheyenne Frontier Days and help, help try to form a, a good long-term direction of Cheyenne Frontier Days. So, I mean, it, as you well know, it's eye-opening even for me to spend so much time in our organization and really not understand like the financial part of Shane Frontier Days and how it all works. It's really mind-boggling when you it, get to that it, level. I, I had no idea the depth and scope of CFD Incorporated, which is really when you're serving on the board, it is much more than just this 10-day Western celebration. Yeah. You're dealing with real estate holdings, investments, so many things that are, you know, this is a corporation, a limited corporation, but it, it is big and complex. And that's why it needs uh, leaders uh, who are serving on that board with expertise in certain disciplines, whether it's fiscal, uh, legal, many of those other kinds of areas. Um, and it was, I felt like when serving on the board, when I came on, not only did I learn a lot, I hope I was able to contribute. I felt like you came in from your history and legacy uh, of Cheyenne Frontier Days, but then you, because you'd had this break and had were bringing up others in leadership, you also brought institutional knowledge, but brought in some fresh perspective about a direction that would sustain Cheyenne Frontier Days and this event and celebration that are this beloved to us, to your family right. for over a century, uh, that we could have something that we could carry into the future. Yeah. You know, I think the one thing that people don't don't quite grasp is you know, we build a budget of about $14, 15000000 million, and we get all of our income back in 10 days. You know how risky that is? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, it is. It's it's like you you have one opportunity to make a living. Yes. Yeah. And, and you know, what if, what if uh, I, I can't imagine if I had to rely on in my own personal life, one paycheck a year. Right. You know, this is it, Diane. You got to, you got to work out. And not many businesses could survive on that. No. And that, and that really lends to the, uh, the volunteer force of mm -hmm. giving us that stability of that mm -hmm. workforce and that, you know, it, it's amazing when you, uh, if you're ever around Cheyenne and you, you come here, you know, the 1st of July and you look around the park and there's nothing going on. And the 10th of July, there's nothing going on. And then all of a sudden everything's up and it's not, it's not coordinated from my end, from the CEOs and mm -hmm. it's, it's all the volunteers. And it's, I mean, it happens like it's almost magical. This park turns into, uh, Cheyenne Frontier Days, and and you really don't know how it happens, and and really you don't want to know because there's so much, th so many things that the volunteers do to put it in place. Yeah, I remember uh, one summer was the last Sunday finals, and I was visiting with a couple people on your staff, and I said, "Are you guys ready for this?" And and your staff member said, it's kind of like the day after Christmas when all the presents are <laughs> opened and the tree looks barren and you've got dirty yeah. dishes and a refrigerator full of leftovers that you have to deal with. But yet, you know, you you get right back in the saddle, so to speak, right. and get ready for the next year. And I think, um, you know, even on that, just touching on the complexities of what it takes to operate uh, this, you know, the the risk components that you have to take into consideration. I think it's important when we think about 
the users of Cheyenne Frontier Days, and many times it's the cowboys who are coming in. You know, they're they're coming in to compete in a rodeo, and they're in and out, and they might not always understand. Um, and I think that's where some of your expertise from being a, 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 a someone who's competed in rodeo, uh, you served as the arena director, as the contestants chairman. Um, can you talk just a little bit? I, I I wanted to get to it and I brushed over it, but just you as the contestant, uh, because you have a special win here at Cheyenne Frontier Days and one of those coveted buckles. Yep. And I just want to be sure that we hit that, Tom, because that's, I know that means something special to you. And I remember being very proud as your friend. So can you talk about um, how long you've been competing in rodeo? We talked about it a little bit, but more importantly about your win here at Cheyenne Frontier Days. So I actually won Cheyenne Frontier Days when I was the contestants chairman, which was, it was, I mean, it it really occurred in an odd way because when you are the contestants chairman, you are so busy during the show that, um, so my first year I was entered in, at Frontier Days, I didn't do any good. And a good friend of mine that I rodeoed with, Harold Bumgarner, who had won the all around, won the steer open here before, uh, he's who I rodeoed with. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to enter Cheyenne this year. I'm too busy during the show. And he went ahead and entered me. I wasn't even supposed to be entered that year. Thank so, you, Harold. <laughs> <laughs> so it was pretty incredible. And I think probably part of the reason that I won is I was so distracted that I never got nervous about it. Mm -hmm. It was just, you know, I'd run and run a steer and then go back to my, to, to work. It was just, in fact, in the, in the Sunday finals, I had to take off my, we wore the tippy ties then. And so I had to take all that stuff off and get on my horse and then put it back on uh, after I made the run. But it was, what was cool is, you know, like the, all the chairmen, you know, they're there. Um, and they all came up to present me the buckle, which doesn't happen mm -hmm. very often. So I don't know that a chairman's ever won Cheyenne Frontier Days before. I don't think it has. But even the people in the arena, when I took my victory lap, all the picket men, everybody came with me. So it was, uh, you know, it was kind of an, an odd win because, uh, you know, felt like it, that I won it for all the volunteers. So that... Uh, you might have to take a minute. <laughs> I think the emotion that you're experiencing right now speaks to the depth of what this event means to so many people. Yeah. The people who volunteer here, the people who compete here, the people who have family connections that go back a century. So, yeah. yeah and so the interesting part, I mean, this was kind of an odd part. My My daughters were getting to the age where they had lots of things they wanted to do. So I told Justin McKee, who was our announcer, that the night before that, I said, you know, this is the last one I'm ever going to run. So um, when you win Cheyenne, you automatically are in the probably the top. At that time, after I won Cheyenne, I probably was in the top five or six of the world. And I'd already been to the national final steer rope, and I'd, I won Pendleton. So, you know, th those were the, the three things I wanted to do was win Pendleton, go to the national finals, and win Cheyenne. And so that was kind of my trifecta there to win that. So when Justin, when he was, he was present the, the deal, he says it to me, he said, you're, and he announced it before I ran my last year, this is going to be the last one. And it, and it was the last one I ever ran. And, and, and I tell people that's as close to even as I was ever going to get. So that's why I quit then. But, um, <laughs> when it, when I was walking off the stage, he, he came back and said, well, you're number six in the world. You've got to keep going. You got to make the national finals. I said, no, this is more important than the national finals. That was your pinnacle. Yep. Well, you had an army of friends and family that were just cheering you on. And congratulations again, even all these years. Um, well, I, when you're contestants, chairman, right? Yeah. You, you hire the stock contractor. <laughs> you hire the timers. You hire yeah. the judges. How could you not win? How could you not win? Absolutely. I would have been the, surprised had you not the won. The deck right? was stacked. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> right. Uh, you know, Tommy, let's, as we get ready to uh, round out this first episode yes. of all things uh, Cheyenne Frontier Days podcast, you've been the CEO here since 2015. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that, you know, you've, you've, you've done great things in this time. And I would just like to uh, have you... Uh, you know, what are the things now we've gone through the past and, and the things that have happened for you as a volunteer and as a, a, a contestant, and now you're the CEO and what is your vision? I've worked, been able to work with you and different subcommittees for this trail guide to the future. But even as we think about today, here we are in 2024, getting ready to 
go into yet another year, Cheyenne Frontier Days. But what what is the future? How do you see it unfolding? And what do you see as being able to ways in which we need to address challenges and not just in your tenure as the CEO, but even for the future beyond? Well, and I think that's that's part of my charge. And, and it's not things that I've done to make CFT successful. It's things we've done. We've got great people like you that have pitched in. We have a great staff. We have great volunteers. So it's a complete team effort to make it. But having a vision of where we want to go. And you helped us with that when we developed our trail guide to the future. So, um, you know, one of the things that we've got to consistently be as leaders in the, in the rodeo industry, um, we've got to stay cutting edge with, um, concerts. Uh, you know, one of the things that we try to do, it's, we get, we get some feedback on this about, well, that that's not a country artist. Well, no, maybe they're not, but we need to expose the younger generation to the Western way of life. And the only way to get them to come here is music. Mm -hmm. And so if we expose them to walking through an old frontier town to go to their concert, that's going to stick in their mind because they don't get that experience anywhere else. So it's, it's always making sure that we are doing things to expose the next generation to the Western way of life, because it's an important way of life. And, and, and that's probably the, any piece of advice moving forward is that's the ones that we have to do. You know, we, we've always talked about, well, we need to develop rodeo fans. Well, rodeo fans become rodeo fans as they get older. Okay. People, when they're, when I was 22 years old, I didn't want to sit through and watch a rodeo. It takes a long time. But as you get a family and you, you become a little bit more grounded, it becomes more important to you. So we've got to expose those people to it and think about them coming back 10, 15 years later, because they will come back mm -hmm. and they'll bring their family back. Yeah. So that that's probably the most important part. We've got to stay, you know, in front of, uh, you know, our primary objective is, you know, with animal care, we've got to be, we absolutely, our animals are such a big part of Shane frontier days. And we've got to make sure that we're doing everything possible to, to, to make sure those animals are safe and the contestants are safe. Um, but, the, but those are some of the things that, you know, that we work on uh, a lot every day. I mean, I don't think people understand how, how much time and effort we put into that. Um, but those are probably some keys about moving forward that, that I mean, there's a lot of, lot of things that go into it. Mm -hmm. But those are, that's, that's what we've got to do is make sure we keep the next generation involved in the Western Way life. Well, this is um, uh, an organization, an event a Western celebration that's that's steeped in tradition, mm -hmm. but yet tradition is only relevant if it resonates with today's consumers and those, whether they're volunteers. And I congratulate you and your staff and the volunteers of Cheyenne Frontier Days for working hard to establish that and uh, setting up something like a podcast, yeah. allowing another vehicle and a mechanism for communicating this to others who may not be as connected. I don't know that many people could sit here and talk about a, a, a over 100 year history with one event and what that legacy is. It's um, it means something to Cheyenne Frontier Days. It means something I know to your family. It means something to all of us. And so thank you again for inviting me to be here with you today. Um, we'll definitely be drinking a beer um, now that we don't have to study anymore, right. you know, we're, we're done with our college <laughs> days. And so raising a, a toast to you um, and just all of you out there listening, please be sure to tune in next time as we'll be discussing frontier nights and the concerts at CFD, because we all know everyone loves music. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Diane.